Hi, this is Rodrigo from Frame Freaking Studio, and this is the Creative Hustler Show. And this time, for the first time, we have a returning inter interview in a returning guest. Uh, he is an amazing artist. Uh, he has been in pre involved in projects such as the Fairly Old Parents, uh, Danny Phantom, Kim Possible, uh, Hysteria, and many more. And he is now launching his new book uh, in order to get it to all the world. Uh, welcome back, Stephen Silver. Thank you, thank you so much for having me back. So, first of all, for the for the very few people who don't know much about you, and the new people who have joined the interviews and haven't watched the previous interview we have with you, can you give us a little bit of info about your history and what you do? Yeah, I'll give a brief uh, intro here. My my background was doing really caricatures. That's where I started uh, really getting serious about drawing. Um, and that, that really happened when I was in high school, uh, about 16, 17 years old, uh, maybe a little bit sooner, but I've been drawing since I was really six. And uh, long story short, from my caricature days of making fun of people, I eventually moved into the animation world back in 1997, where I was hired as a character designer um, for Warner Brothers Television Animation on a show called Hysteria. And really, at that point, I had no idea what a character designer does. Um, it just felt very familiar with me because I feel like character design is much like uh, caricature. And that's where the journey truly started for me. So I've been doing that ever since, as well as really uh, pursuing teaching because that's what I uh, enjoy doing, you know, really more than anything, I think. Nice. And since last time we spoke, uh, you launched a Kickstarter for your new book, uh, how to do character on um, character design and how to do how to do a great job with it. Uh, I was looking back at it and it, you asked for it about ten thousand dollars and you got like one hundred and fourteen thousand dollars. Right. Uh, can you tell us more about this book? Yeah, yeah. Um, so the book's called The Silver Way, and for many years, I've, I've always self-published my own books. I've, uh, I've always put out material, but it's never been a how-to book. And for now, what I really wanted to do was create that how-to book. I've been teaching for you know over twenty years now, and I had so much information and so much knowledge that I've had so many notes that I've just built up over the years of. I found when I've been teaching, trying to break down that process and how to explain things to people. And as I was doing that, I was taking little notes and came up with different formulas and different ways just to really express it and explain what it is that I, what I do and how to build that up. So I thought um, it'd be awesome just to create um, just a real, you know, big giant book that would sort of cover all that information and that's when I got in touch with uh, Design Studio Press who ended up being the editors and the publishers on the book um, but in order to do so I needed to generate some money to uh, just to get it going and then just to get that interest and see if there was the interest out there and it just really um, went beyond my wildest expectations and I just got a lot of backers and realized that a lot of people um, we're wanting this and that's what really led to the success of the Kickstarter and inevitably being able to create the book. So I ended up doing a soft cover and a hardcover version. The hardcover version was just exclusively for the Kickstarter supporters. So that wasn't sold on the side. And, um, and now it's a book that's being spread around and do schools and different, um, animation studios. And it's again, it, to me, it was my baby, you know, this was my real, you know, I got two kids of my own, but this was a real precious thing uh, for me to be able to put all this content um, into this one uh, place for artists just to really understand the process and the production process. Because a lot of artists, I feel they want to do character design, but they don't really understand the process for animation. And you know, they want to work in the studios and they want to do this, but there's a production aspect to that that I really wanted to make sure that I it came across um, in the book as well. 
Definitely. I've been seeing because uh, lately we have been trying to look at more artists, not only for interviewing, but also like options that we can hire in the future. Uh, and we have we have seen this trend that there are many people calling themselves like character designers. And I see that they, what they are trying to do, but it's like they are not going into that level where you can say they are actually a, a character designer. Uh, what do you think is about this career uh, called character designer that attracts so many people? You know, I think people just inherently love drawing people and they love drawing animals and they love drawing creatures. And it's just something that we, you know, we see every day and, and it's storytelling and that's what we're looking at. And we're looking at these things and, and it really is one of those um, jobs in the animation industry or just in the industry in general that people are just fascinated with uh, because there, there's, you know, like a prop designer or a background designer where sometimes that can become a lot more mechanical where when you're drawing, you know, humans, animals, care, you know, the creatures, it's just a lot more organic. And in all honesty, again, depending on what you enjoy, it's just a, a lot more fun. And it's definitely not as much hard work as a storyboard artist, you know, has to go through or animator. There's a lot more work, but everything's always character driven. Licensing is character driven. So everything in the licensing world, in the animation world, they're not promoting and showing backgrounds or props or storyboards. It's always character based. And I think that's what people are seeing. They look at these characters and Again, you could go from back, from way back, from all the Disney characters, from you know, from Sword in the Stone, 101 Dalmatians, I mean, and just leading up to Tarzan or even The Incredibles and all these different feature films and animated series where, again, it's the character that people fall in love with. Um, and that's why I think there's such a tremendous draw that people go, gosh, I want to do that. I want to be a part of that um, and experience that. And I think that's the real um, thing that people need to, um, why they want to do it. It's just, you need to decide. It's not just concept art. You know, there's uh, people sort of mix it up. They think they could just do, and that's what I see a lot in portfolios. They just do a one-off design of a character, but they're not really exploring it. And they're not doing expressions and they're not doing attitudes and they're not doing turnarounds. And that's what's missing in a lot of character designers' portfolios. Definitely. I see exactly that, what you just mentioned, that there is like, oh, the portfolio of the people who are calling themselves like character designers, and they just have like a couple of different characters that they have come up with. But if I go and see your work, for example, uh, you have maybe one character and from many views and many different options and all the kind of faces and tests, like if you put a mustache without it, a bear or without it, like bowl and all all these things uh, for just one person right. or on more, most portfolios, it's like uh, all different characters. like. Right. Is. Yeah. It's just like a one off of each character. And, you know, and then you got to be extremely versatile, too. If you're wanting to work in this industry, clients, all clients have different needs um, and they, they want different styles and they want different just, you know, let's see what you can come up with. And then so it's the options and for you to be able to provide them with those options or even match and mimic other people's styles. Because a lot of times you're going to get people who say, hey, you know what? We really like the style of, you know, uh, I don't know, say Alex Toth or, or whoever it may be, Frank Fazetta. Or, I mean, there could be so many different variations or more contemporary artists. And then they want you to try to create new characters, but mimic that style. Or they say, hey, we love the style of Danny Phantom. We want to, you to do something like that. Otherwise, we like the style of SpongeBob. We want you to create the characters that are goofy um and expressive like that so the more again versatile you are as an artist and especially designer the better chances you have of getting that job also this is a theme that i've been uh, finding out lately and if i try to remember who was the first person who i heard this about was uh hayao miyazaki where he was trying to describe the reason why the animation industry in Japan was going bad. 
that it was because they had all these artists who pretty much are just locked up in their houses, in their rooms, uh, driving the same thing over and over again. And pretty much uh, what he said is that an artist needs to go out, needs to go have a life to, in order to have all these references. And I see that many people are just locking themselves in their computers or in their books and doing the same art. Uh, how do you think that influences uh, the way you do things or the way like great artists do things? Well, it's absolutely essential. It's actually one of the main cores of what I discuss in my book is the observation because that is vital. You know, you got to draw characters. You got to observe characters. You got to be sitting in a restaurant. You may be in a coffee shop and you see someone walk in that has a hunchback or or is walking in a very weird way or someone, all these different body shapes and these different sizes and all these different sorts of aspects that make a character a character. If you're not drawing from life and you're not observing that, it's going to be that much harder. You know, the same thing with, you know, I mean, not everyone has the opportunity to travel and go all different places, but if you do get the opportunity to travel and even just go into different countries, different continents, different cities, you see different people, even in America here, from city to city, from California to Iowa, are different looking people. And there's something about them that makes them look a little bit different from a Californian person. But if you go from here to Paris and you look at an Italian person, a French person, a German person, and you look at their features and you study that and you draw from that, you can start to bring that into your characters to where you start to understand things and you can start to, you know, say, even when you're in public and you look at someone, why does that person look so gentle? Why does that person look so evil? You know, it's like, what is about their face structure, their bone structure? And this is the huge part that I think people are missing on. So they're not able just to bring it into their own work and then just make stuff up. So what happens is a lot of people, because they're not observing, their, their work becomes, their characters become very generic, you know, and they just become just very, everything becomes even, everything just becomes ordinary and there's no real, you want to be able to look at a character and go, I've seen that guy. Wow, that guy looks like my uncle Teddy. You know, that guy looks like this person. Oh, my teacher, I had a teacher like that once and I hated her. You know, and, and you want to be able to bring that out in your characters. And again, this is something that you can only get that, in my opinion, and like you mentioned, this other artist mentioned, through real world experience and observation and not just hiding behind the computer screen or just looking at stuff on the computer or even for that matter, copying other people's artwork. You're not going to get that same um, feeling, um, which is vital. Definitely. Uh, one of the funny experiences that I have similar to this was uh, I, I spent uh, some time in Europe and I traveled to Germany for a, a couple of days and there was something there. <laughs> I don't know what it was, uh, genetics or whatever, but half of the people looked like normal and the other half like look very, very angry, like they were ready to beat your ass anytime if you even say hello. And funny thing is that if you talk to them, like they are like the nicest people and the uh, kindest people you will ever imagine. They just have this angry looking yeah. face. And, yeah. and it was like, yeah. this would be a good comic. <laughs> Right, absolutely. Yes, yeah, like the muscles in their face, and the it's almost the wear and tear, and the, the you know any sort of things people have gone through just to be able to read that in their face. But I, I would say I had the same experience. You know, when you go to some of these different places, you know, and yeah, you just people look hard. You know, God, they look so tough and so mean and hard. You know, as opposed to oh, excuse me, I gotta shut my door here. Um, as opposed to, you know, sometimes you'll see people, again, that softness um, within their face. So, uh, you know, and weather, weather can play a huge role in that. If, if it's very cold, the colder climates, people, their faces will scrunch up, you know, sometimes a little bit more than sometimes a place where it's, you know, sunny and shiny, like going to Hawaii or something where people feel like a lot more calm or you could even you know spain places where things are a lot slower you know it's just like people they're not in such a rush all the time and and it's again different mentality but these are the things you want to observe 
and people. And then by seeing that, you can bring that into your back into your designs. On your experience as a teacher, uh, what do you think is the most common mistakes that people make when they are trying to learn character design, but that they are not aware that they are doing? You know, I'd say one of the most common things that people in all honesty are lacking in their design is a true understanding of basic construction. And I see this over and over and over again. And you go construction, that's almost like the first thing you should really learn. That's the foundation that you get that from figure drawing. You get that from just observation, drawing the head, drawing different things like this. And um, I really feel like that's what's missing um, in a lot of the drawings. So they feel like they're just falling apart and, and it doesn't feel solid and it doesn't feel like, um, you know, the draftsmanship is there. So that's, that's missing. Um, and then I think just feeling, you know, I think another thing that's missing a lot in people's work is the feeling, the attitude, the gesture um, of that to where then the, the drawings, they feel sort of stiff and lifeless. And another common mistake people make a lot of the time, another thing that I discuss within the book is avoiding the ladder. People end up making everything so even in their designs that they're not incorporating enough angles, enough contrast in their design. And that's what's making it feel just a little bit weak too. Nice. Also, in the same context, like what is like the most the things that you will recommend people to focus on that they are not doing it in general speak. Yeah. In general, again, it taps down into the observation. I think um, it's important to not just look at other artists work, but copy other artists works just to understand the foundation. And that means even just tracing and doing tracings of, of shapes over the, actual other drawings just to understand breaking down the shape language just a little bit i think that's very important and that's something that i recommend to people to do all the time um so the yeah these are some um big areas that uh people just inherently are are really uh, missing and again it comes down to that real experience go out draw in public draw from life Look at draw people in situations that you're uncomfortable doing. You know, if it means drawing the back of their head or the back three quarter of you, um, look at the wrinkles in the clothing of someone. And these are all different areas that people sort of need to make sure that they're constantly um, just sketching because people will draw all the time and say, hey, I'm drawing all the time, but my drawings aren't getting any better. And that's a lot of the time because of the lack of observation, you know, within within the work and the lack of, you know, just the feeling and gesture. So I'm always trying to push, just learn how to draw. Um, you know, you don't need to know all the muscles in the body, you know, just learn how to draw the human figure. You know, I think that's going to pay off tremendously. Last week I had a call with Nathan Fox and he mentioned something very similar to this, that uh, what he says is that he sees many people doing a lot of work, a lot of drawings, uh, and not improving. And that's because, like, our instincts or what or I see, like, uh, it's pretty much just, uh, it has just a certain limited perspective. And uh, there is, like, something else, like the soul that you have to put, like, what is the and gold of this illustration that we were doing that we need to have in mind and first work into that end goal and lately just put like what we observe into it and that pretty much like our instincts work against us in that kind of sense. Uh, what do you think about, uh, how would you put that on, how would you advise into getting this other sense that goes against our instincts, but like it is the counterintuitive thing, but at the same time, how we, can we put this soul into the art that we do? You know, I mean, I think the bottom line, it just comes down to um, just really observing other people's, you know, work just to get a different sort of understanding and a different take um, because it, 
It's not what you usually do, right? So if you're looking and trying to break down, but I think it's under, once again, understanding the fundamentals and breaking down so you can look at someone's work and you, got, you really got to go analyze it. You know, why, why is that working? You know, how, why, what, what is it about that drawing that resonates with me? Why is it so exciting to look at? Is it because of the um, negative and positive space? Is it the contrast in angles? Is it the balance? It's like, what is it that's sort of happening within that? And that's where I think you start to pull in someone else's spirit or soul or the soul of the drawing into your own work by, by doing that. So it's forming these sort of study habits um, which will eventually pay off in your own work. Nice. Also, something that I wanted to ask you because of the kind of the same situation that we came up from, uh, there are many uh, people in Latin America and even in Europe, there are a couple of countries where they don't have like that much access to good art schools and, and to have it in, in presence. Uh, what will be... Uh, some good places to look for the internet in order to try to get uh, the best experience and the best knowledge into becoming uh, a great artist and a great character developer. Wow. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, I mean, there, there's a lot of sites out there probably that, that I don't know about. I think, again, it just comes down to look at the or try to discover and find the artists websites and people who are in the industry that you want to get involved in because that's who you're going not that, that you're going up against but those are the people who are working in the field and doing things so by looking at their work their portfolios you can look at that for yourself and go hmm you know i, I want to be a uh, game concept design character designer and create a who, who's doing that and try to research that so it's not so much about just the 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 you know the how or just looking at that it's really about you know the why and 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 you first of all why do i even want to do this you got to look into yourself and go why do i want to do this what excites me about this and then start i think really researching those artists and oftentimes you're going to find that a lot of your favorite artists have their own books they they're they're teaching online already so these are different resources for people out there to you know tap into like almost like what we're doing on schoolism um you know it's like someone who wants to learn character design for the industry and working in the industry well well that's what i do so in a sense wouldn't it make sense to just try to chase and find those people that are doing what it is that you want to do and learn from that if possible if you can afford it or whatever other situation but these are things about it's all comes down to initiative it comes down to taking the initiative but more importantly knowing what it is that you want you got to know what you want you know because otherwise you're looking at everything and then by looking at everything you're all over the place um and i think that's where people um start to lack or fall behind is because they don't truly know what it is they want to do you can't just say i want to be a character designer it's like i can't just say i want to be a doctor well what kind of doctor do you want to be do you want to be a brain surgeon do you want to be a foot doctor do you want to be a eye doctor so you've got to start just really honing it down a little bit more and you start to that huge universe and that huge window that looks impossible and just looks like overwhelming and how do i learn and i don't have the resources well start to refine it and really refine it and then look for those teachers and those mentors and those people that are doing what it is that you do and want to do and and learn from that it's the same with it just i don't care what profession you want to do if you wanted to be a real estate agent Find a real estate agent that's good at what they do and try to maybe become an intern, learn from them, do something. You want to do be a skydiver, you want to go skydiving. Same thing, how do you skydive? Who, who, where do they skydive at? And start diving into it. Find books, research, and, and these are all the things that I highly recommend people do instead of, it's not just a one size fits all you know industry. And even sometimes with art schools, they, they, there's too many things going on where people they end up being lost by the time they even leaving art school. I still don't, I don't know what to do. I don't know what to be because there was no real focus on any one thing. So people are really confused. 
definitely I have seen that in a lot of areas in life. Uh, one thing that I think is happening here with character design is that is like you mentioned before, it's a cool career, so everybody wants to do it. Right. But the, I think also there are people who maybe will be better background designers or, right. or better people who will go into light and, and shadows and things like that. Uh, what would be your advice in order to discover what is your one thing where you can truly excel? You know, I think first, uh, most important is really try a lot of different things. Um, but I feel like you kind of know. You know, it's like most people will know at a very young age that what they're attracted to, what they like. And it's like, so it's like following that. I mean, one of my biggest advices that I give to uh, my students are take a lot of the different ideas or the, the jobs that you, you think you might be interested in. It could be prop designer, color stylist, background layout artist, character designer, animator, and write all of them down on like a three by five card, just a little card. And you might have 20 or 25 things or so that you've, you've thought of, you've thought of everything and put it down on the floor and look at it so you can look at it and start to pull away the things that you absolutely have no interest in. You know what? I have no interest in doing gallery paintings. Okay, I'm going to pull that away. You know what? I have no interest in doing prop design. That seems boring to me. I don't want to do that. It's too technical. Pull that away. 3D animation, pull that away. And see what's left on the ground there. See what's left in front of you that, well, you know, there's some maybe it always falls into that design aspect there's a few little areas and then you got to decide that hey you know what i love doing three of these things four of these things well then you know you can in your portfolio showcase those four different things you can have prop design character design storyboarding background layout you know if these are all things that you're enjoy doing and showcase that but it's very far and few people that I find that really excel in everything. You know, there's, there's always the one thing people just are really good at. And again, it comes down to experimentation. It comes down to putting in the effort. It comes down to the time and experience that you're going to put into something. I quite honestly feel that a lot of people just don't draw enough. This is the big thing that, again, I, I'm very strict with my students. Um, and I just, I try to, even when I give them an assignment and I see they, they, the very little effort they put into it, some of them, some of them really go beyond. And those are the people that I know are going to succeed in this industry. The people that aren't putting in the effort and putting in the time, um, you know, doing that. And you may say, well, it's not really what I want to do. So, um, but they, well, then, you know, you know, pretty quickly, um, but just know that this industry, it's very, uh, it's very quick. There's great demands in it. You know, people need stuff. They want to work with professionals. So you better like what it is that you do. All I can say is don't put things in your portfolio that you don't enjoy doing because then you just may end up getting that job and then you're going to be really miserable. So just put in your portfolio the things that you find good. But again, know what's required if you say again that you want to do character design well what it what is required in a character designer's portfolio what's required in a prop designer's portfolio what's required for an animator's portfolio and research 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 and do everything you can to try to find out what that is yeah i also think the mind freak us uh for example i had this experience where i was working in a tv production company uh that was making like TV ads and things like that. And by the crisis of 2008, they had to fire a lot of people and I was like the IT guy. So they have gotten this camera, a red camera that was more a computer than a camera. So they took me and started teaching me on that. And at the time I had many friends who were like really crazy about film and about these kind of things. So I thought, oh, maybe like, Many of my best friends like really love this thing. Probably I'm going to love it too. And I ended up figuring out that I completely hated it and I have no <laughs> idea. <laughs> but yeah, I think that was like uh, one of the the mistakes that I had to take because I, I, I ended up like resigning from that company because they were making me do that job. And they, and it was like, no, no, I cannot take this anymore. Right, yeah, yeah. 
you know, it's trial and error. Again, you got to give something time and just know that you're here for as long as you're here on this planet. And just if you're investing five months into something, a year into something, well, it's one year of experience and trying something to see if that's something you want to carry through with. So don't, don't feel that you should just quit straight away so quickly try it and then discover it. And you know, you'll, you'll, you'll know pretty quickly whether you love something or hate it. But that's why I'm saying a lot of times you already know it's already inherently within you, you know, cause you were drawing it when you were seven years old, 10 years old, 15 years old. You kind of feel like, you know, I'm drawing fantasy stuff. God, I love, I love fantasy stuff. So, you know, stick with that, move into that realm. Also something that I wanted to say and then ask is that, Many of my team members told me to thank you about the art talks that you do on YouTube, that they it has helped them a lot in order to resolve many doubts that they had uh, from uh, practical doubts to philosophical doubts that they had in the careers and on the path that they wanted to take. Uh, so first of all, in the name of all the team of Free Freak Studio, thank you for that. Uh, thank you, thank but secondly, uh, what made you take the decision to go into YouTube and start doing these shows there? Yeah, you know, I was doing something, um, I think, it, I can't even remember, I think it was called Ustream um, a long time ago um, before YouTube and I was just doing some videos from there more than anything just to get my message out because I would get a lot of emails from people um, asking me questions and I think that was what ignited it. And then I started that. And then what really started the YouTube um, channel was I just kind of got fed up one day. I got this email from these, um, these people who were telling me about this horrible experience they were facing about not getting paid for something and valuing, you know, something was happening. And um, I've always believed in the business side of art and understanding your value and your worth. And so the very first video I think that I'm, mainly did on the YouTube, which almost launched it was I went off on a rant about, you know, just valuing your art and the importance of not being just taken advantage of and speaking up and knowing what you're worth and all that. And from there, it got so much attention that it led me to just realize that a lot of people need to hear stuff and hear things. So the my whole YouTube channel didn't become about that, you know, sure, there's certain aspects that I'll uh, different shows that I talk about that, but it started just to open up into um, the business, you know, the, the what's going on in the, and not just the business, but the mindset and how you, how you should react to things or not react to things and, and things just to be aware of. And so it's really just um, gone in that whole direction. So I'm 136 episodes um, to date that I have. So if someone once if you're ever sitting and just drawing out there, you could just go to my YouTube channel and just there's 136 uh, art talks to listen to just to really just feed your soul and just, you know, hear, hear the advice. And a lot of it is from my own personal experience that what a great platform to be able to share this. And again, with people all over the world. And that's why what I love about uh, doing it on YouTube. Nice. Yeah, definitely. This is something, uh, the, part of the reason why I came back to the interviews, because in the beginning we did it to learn, because we didn't uh, knew many things about the industry, but we were able to figure out the doubts. Uh, then uh, pretty much it went into a, a, a pause, and I was thinking like, well, how can we go like into the next level and keep learning things? and meeting more people and that we can maybe hire in the future or work with. And it was like, oh, okay, I already had the answer, so I retook it. But there was this thing. Uh, I initially was an introvert, for example, uh, and I had to learn like to overcome that uh, through through the years. And now like I'm kind of this weird mix of extrovert and introvert. As well. yeah. <laughs> but there are many people who I see who are like great artists, uh, who have like a good enough work, but they are not well known because they are like really shy. They don't want to put themselves out. Even with these interviews, I have uh, reached to kind 
a couple of uh, artists who are like really talented guys who are working for movies and things like that. And they are shy, like they don't want yeah. to appear in front of the camera and things like that. Uh, how do you, uh, what would be your advice in order to overcome that shyness in order to let your work known to the world? Yeah, you know, I mean, it's, it's one of these things too where I think it, you you have to decide if you really want to break out of that. You know, because some people, they're inherently shy. They're going to be shy. They're uncomfortable. They're introverted. And they'll come up with every excuse as to why not to be in front of people. A lot of times it just, you know, sometimes it stems just from their childhood and maybe the, the way they were treated and through family, friends, bullied or something else that made them this way. So they got a lot of their own things they have to deal with. Um, so it's sort of hard to sort of lay a whole brush and just do that. But what I, what I would say is you got to decide that you want to be a more confident person. And by doing that, that means putting yourself in uncomfortable situations of just, okay, usually I'm not going to ask someone for help or advice. Okay. But today I'm going to do it. I'm going to go and I'm, I'm going to ask them. Or if you get the opportunity in an audience or someplace to raise your hand and ask a question in, in public because that's people's biggest fear a lot of times is speaking in public because people are scared what other people think. And it, oftentimes it's just not real. It's so much in their head. Um, so again, that deciding that, you know what, I'm sick of being like this. I feel like it is holding me back and I'm not getting out there and doing my own stuff. Well, then you're the only one that can control that. You know, there's nothing else that anyone else is going to say or anyone else is going to do Um, other than you saying that, you know, I got to put myself in that uncomfortable situation and just, uh, just do it more again with everything, with art, you know, life, everything is practice and you just got to do it more, make that, make it be uncomfortable. And eventually it starts to get more comfortable and you realize, you know what? No one cares. You know, it's just like, they just don't, you know, and I think we have it in our head and our mind that people are going to say something and they're going to react to us and they're going to. They laugh at us, so they're gonna, you know, what are they gonna do? And oftentimes, nothing. It's gonna be a moment of maybe that person will, uh, I don't know, do something or say something, but it's one little flickering moment in time and it's really meaningless. So, um, again, just decide what it is that you want to do. Hey, I want to start selling my own things. I got to get out there. I got to go to conventions. I got to go to workshops. I got to do this, that, and that and just do it. And that's the bottom line that I, I feel. Definitely. I I did went through this phase of like, kind of realizing that nobody really gives a shit. Like, nobody cares. And yeah. it was so funny to see like how many years I have wasted. Like, right. Yeah, kind of absolutely. Yeah, yeah, it's all in your head. A lot of the time, it's just this thing that's just in your head when it's not real. You know, it's like they, there's a saying, they say like, um, you know, like uh, fear is not real, but, you know, but danger is real. So you, if you're standing on the edge of a cliff, you know, and trying to lean over, well, that's dangerous. And that that's real. That's a real fear that you could have. But, um, you know, just the, the fear in your mind is not real. If you just have that fear, you're just creating it. You know, it's not real danger. It's not dangerous to go talk to someone you know, or say something or put yourself in public, you know, certain situations. I mean, I'm sure you could say that there, there might be, you know, but uh, the reality is a lot of things, you got to weigh that thing. Is this really a dangerous thing or is it more of my own fear base that I'm creating this myself because I'm afraid of what someone might think, what someone may say. And um, it, it, it doesn't matter. What I would say to someone is test it. If you're afraid that, you know, and you think that people are going to react, do something weird, put on some sort of hat that has crazy bunny ears or some, something looking or a, a really bright pink color or some, something that you don't usually ever wear or do and go out and see how people react. And the reason I say that is because I did that one time. I, you know, my daughter had this bright purple uh sort of hat that was very odd looking and i thought and she wanted me to wear it i'm like oh my, i'm not gonna wear that i'll look silly in it and then you know i say you know what i will look silly in it but i'm gonna put it on i'm gonna wear it today in public when i run all my errands so i went to the grocery store i went to the bank i went to the post office 
I went to all these different places wearing this stupid, crazy purple hat, and no one looked at me, and no one said a word, and it just made me real. And I drove around in it, and no one responded, and I realized no one cares, you know? And even if they did, they're not going to say anything to your face anyway. So what does it matter? <laughs> yeah, definitely. Also, you are one of the artists that I know, one of the few who has, like, really learn well uh, this business side of the art. Like, you're really good at it. However, I see that many artists like focusing completely on the art side, uh, which sometimes is good. Like, uh, their art is the one who talks for them and they get jobs and things like that. However, yeah. in most of the cases, I see like people could do way better if they just have like at least the basics of selling and business and understanding companies uh, and, and things like that. Uh, how was your path into learning all this thing? And what will be your advice for people now who don't have these business skills and how to develop them? Yeah, you know, my biggest advice in all honesty is just read. You know, where, so when I was 18 years old, I was, uh, that's when I, I moved out of my house and I sort of was working doing caricatures and wanting to start my own freelance company. So I had to learn, you know, I got screwed a few times in order to realize, oh my God, I don't want this anymore and started to just self-educate myself. And I would buy books on how to write contracts, how to read contracts, guerrilla marketing, how to market yourself, how to you know, but getting books on trade, understanding trademark, understanding copyright, and always just learning. Because again, this is the important thing is like one should always be reading and learning and try to educate yourself and not just just wait for someone else just to tell be thrown into that situation or wait for someone else to tell you. Again, this is the self discipline. This is the desire. This is, hey, you know what? I've been screwed one too many times, or I don't know enough about this. And and there's so many books out there and so much knowledge that of other people's experiences. And that's all I did. And so I learned from others' experiences. I watched documentaries. I watched, you know, these things. I learned about history. And I learn about and all these things. So it, for me, I love to try to learn something new almost every day, whether I just might be reading about something, I might be watching a documentary, I might be watching just uh, listening while I'm working to someone else's experience. And these are the things that are educating my mind and filling it up. And I think if you're not doing those things, well, then the road, this journey is just, it's going to take you a lot longer to learn those lessons. So once again, it's that decision that you have to make do, do you want to learn this? You know, do you feel it's important? And I say, yes, you should feel it's important, especially if this is an industry you want to get into and work full time. Otherwise, people will take advantage of you over and over again. Um, so you got to just, you know, shape up and wise up and, and learn what you can and let it be a part of your daily routine or weekly routine or whatever it is that you need to do. But it's vital. Definitely. Uh, since, since the last time we talk, uh, we registered a business in the United States, in Delaware. And I remember when I was starting like, the process and all that, they gave us all these guys uh, for legal issues and taxes and understanding, uh, which was like for me, taxes and all that was hard enough in my country. And now, like, I had to completely forget all of, all that and learn from zero to understand how the system works in the U.S. Yeah. And I remember in that moment, uh, before registering the company and things like that, like, that was very scary for me because I kind of thought of myself, like, well, I'm not this good, like, in taxes and things like that. And for a moment, for a couple of days, it just paralyzed me on this kind of fear. And I was just me looking at all these guys. And then it was like, you know what? Like, OK, let's do this. Like, uh, yeah. let's face this challenge, uh, because yeah. this thing will solve many problems for us that right now we are facing for many years. And if we have this, like, we will have access to many other opportunities. So this challenge is worth it. And it was one of these moments, again, where like there was more fear than it was actually there, because 
what I learned was that the tax and legal system of the U.S. was way simpler than my own country. So <laughs> it's like, oh, <laughs> this, yeah. this is much better. But yeah, I think there is like a, a lot of fear and doubt when it comes to these kind of technical things in, in, into learning these things. But at the same time, I think that sacrifice is truly worth it uh, to learn these things to become better and, and right. be able to take charge of these opportunities. Yeah, it'll pay off in the end. You know, you'll be better off for it in the end and you won't feel like you're, um, you know, even more worried about stuff now because you feel like you understood something, you've taken care of it and you've done the right thing, you know, for it. So that's important. Also, you are having an event in November, right? Uh, can you tell us more about this event? Yeah, um, on November 16th in Los Angeles, actually in Burbank, um, it's in between. There's a show that I go to called DesignerCon, and that's going to be uh, the weekend of the 11th, and that's a two-day um, show. So it's a good time to come to L.A. And then at the other end of the week, there's going to be the CTN um, Expo. Um, so what I'm doing, I'm going to be doing a full day workshop um, on character design and just, you know, just really giving people the, the knowledge and awareness of the, having the right mindset, things to, you know, how to present yourself, how to present your portfolio, um, and just tapping into uh, drawing exercises and all good things like that. And people who do come for the day, they'll get one of my books for free. Um, and also that, you know, lunch will be provided too. So it's going to be a full day fun event. Um, and there's more information about it on my website in the events, uh, section, my website, silvertoons.com. And if you go to the events, you can see, um, where it's written down in there. And if anyone's going to be in LA or in Burbank during that time, um, they, they're more than uh, welcome to sign up, um, and attend. Nice. Uh, we will try to go there. Uh, we are trying to plan a, a, a huge trip for the, for Los Angeles in November and try to this time take advantage of all the things because in the beginning it was a little bit overwhelming for us. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, I wanted to ask you as well uh, on this same topic, uh, which type of which events would you recommend artists to go and how to make the most out of them? Mm -hmm. You know, I think just going to, um, a, you know, any events where you're getting just to, just to see how different artists are displaying their work and what they're showcasing, I, I all year round you should be going to events. You should be going to any sort of, wherever you live in the world, if there's any sort of comic convention, if there's any sort of book expo, if there's any sort of fan expo, whatever it may be, that's what I highly recommend. I also recommend if you can go to figure drawing classes, go to figure drawing classes and, and take things and do things like that. It's just like, because that, again, this is where, um, it's not that you're going to these places looking for um, to get jobs, to get work necessarily, because none of these places um, are gonna be like that, you know, unless it's specifically labeled as a job fair or a job expo, which, there really aren't too many in the animation industry. Um, but that, you know, again, there's different places like even, um, uh, in France, there's a show called Angoulême, which happens in, you know, a great, uh, you know, expo. There's another event called Annecy, uh, which is a big animation sort of expo. And these are places where, again, the more you can just, you know, anything is good in all honesty, because again, you want to be able to meet people, talk to people, show people your artwork, um, and make sure you're getting the sort of information that's going to benefit you and the people that you, um, you know, want to, um, learn from or, um, understand a little bit about may be there where you can talk to them. And that's where most of all these artists that you see attending one show are nearly at majority of the shows. Um, and that, that's what I would recommend is I go to all of them. <laughs> Nice. Uh, also, is there any last advice that you would like to give to people that we haven't talked about? Um, you know, I think we sort of like covered a lot here, but I, I mean, my biggest advice is just know what it is that you want to do. Just know what it is you want to do and constantly always be a student. Keep learning. You're never going to stop learning. You know, no matter what, no matter how you go about doing it, whether it's through yourself, where you're self-educating yourself, 
whether self-study, whether it's through books, whether it's through videos, whether it's through classes, whatever it is that you are able to do, just do it and just know what it is you want to do. And that's my biggest advice to anyone because that's going to help push you in the direction. And, and just know that this life is a journey, that there is no destination. There is no final thing. There is no one job you're going to get in this industry, in your career, that's going to be the pinnacle. That's going to be the, I've achieved it. I'm there. I, I got it. I don't care if you've won an Oscar. You're still not going to be satisfied. You still There's always going to be the next thing after that. So constantly set goals for yourself, but just look at it as though you're on a sailboat and a sailboat through life and you're working your way towards the sunset of life, which is going to be the end of your life, you know, and hopefully you have a long life. But along that, along that journey, you're going to be just getting off on different places and different ports. You know, there was a poem called Ithaca, which is a Greek poem, which I love. And it talks of this and you, you'll set sail and you'll reach many ports in life and many destinations. And through there, you'll acquire certain things and you'll buy things and you'll gain the knowledge. But you're going to get back on that boat and you're going to constantly set sail. And at the end of the day, when you reach your final years in life, you realize that all the experience you gained are the true riches in life. There's going to be nothing else. It's not going to be about any one thing. It's not going to be. And, and that's the reality. So that's what I would say. Just accept this journey that you're on. Learn, grow, have fun. Um, enjoy the process. Draw all the time. Draw from observation. Keep doing what it is you can to get better. Um, and um, have fun, and that's the bottom line. Definitely, I I think that last part, like if you, that's a good tip to find out what you're passionate about. Because if you're not having fun, then the, then there's definitely something wrong with either your perception or whatever you're doing. <laughs> mm -hmm. Like one of these two things. Yeah. If people want to find you online, where can they do it? So yeah, you can find me online at silvertunes.com. Um, I think by going through there, you're going to find all my stuff. You can purchase my book through there if you like, where I'll sign it for you. Um, it's also available on Amazon. It's just not signed. But there you'll see um, just from my YouTube channel where I'm on YouTube um, with Silvertunes is my channel for there. So you'll be able to find the links to my different, my Facebook, my YouTube, and all that other good stuff uh, through my silvertunes.com uh, website, I think is the best place to go. Sort of like one-stop shop just to take you everywhere. Nice. Thanks a lot for being here and giving us your time. I know you're a very busy person. So it was great to have you here again. Well, thank you. Thanks for having me again. It's always great to talk to you and talk to your audience. So if you have liked this interview, please click the like button below and share this with all your friends because I think this will be really useful for them. Uh, this has been the last episode of the Creative Hustle Show. Until next time.